Before I get started, I always just like to let people know um, that first, the Sacagawea Interpretive Cultural and Educational Center is located on the traditional homelands of the Agadika Shoshone-Bannock people, um, and that tonight's program is um, by me, and uh, I am not Agadika Shoshone-Bannock, nor am I indigenous. So this program and the, her story that I'm telling tonight is told through the lens of a Euro-American um, so just so you're aware of that, that I don't have any cultural ties to Sacagawea. So with that, um, I'll get started. So this image is um, from our site. Uh, those are what we are known as the Beaverhead Mountains in the back. Um, and Limhigh Pass is also located up here. And this is where Lewis and Clark and Sacagawea would meet up with her people, uh, the Gaidika Shishon Bannock. So to begin, what is in a name? So one of the biggest questions we get here at the Sacagawea Center is what was her name? How do you pronounce it? And what did it mean? Um, you've probably heard there's a couple different variations of her name um, out there. Uh, Sacagawea, Sacagawea, Sacagawea. Um, so, you know, big question is which one is right? And so uh, Sacagawea is probably one of the most famous women in American history. Um, there are almost four statues dedicated to her than all and then any women throughout the world. And with that name recognition comes this controversy. What was her name and what does it mean? So here in Salmon, Idaho, um, the Sacagawea Center uses the traditional Shoshone spelling, uh, spelled with a J and pronounced Sacagawea. And many people in this region use that pronunciation and spelling. The Lewis and Clark Trail Heritage Foundation and many other Lewis and Clark historians use Sacagawea um, and spelled with a G instead of a J. And this is actually the spelling that was officially established as how to say and pronounce her name by the Board of Ethnology in 1910. So for over 100 years, this kind of conversation about what is her name has been going on. So while the Sacagawea spelling with a G is often attributed to the Mandan and Hidatsa nations and is sometimes used among them as well, uh, the other well-known pronunciation and spelling of that name um, is in fact the, the Hidatsa one, Sacagawea. It has two Ks um, and I, you know, I have it a little later in my program, that spelling. And it was probably an attempt by a Euro-American to spell the Hidatsa word for bird woman, because um, the Hidatsa spelling uh, has kind of a T in it. It's and um, it doesn't look like uh, some people would say it's pronounced. Um, so because it is a, a traditional Hidatsa name. So again, um, Sacagawea is the sh kind of the Shoshone pronunciation. Um, Sacagawea is more of the kind of an Englishized version of Sacagawea, which is the Mandan um, and Hidatsa pronunciation or what they called her. So here we are in 2024, and there's three or more um, different variations of her name. So some people say, well, why don't you look in the Lewis and Clark journals? She was with them. They wrote her name down. They would have known how to say it. Um, and you could, but they also spelled her name 15 different ways in the journals. Um, I have a whole list of all the ways they spelled it. So to us, that's not a very reliable source, um, as you know. They, 15 different ways they spelled her name, um, including a spelling by Clark of Sakargawea with an R in there. They also refer to her as Janie in the journals. So here again at the center, we choose to use the Shoshone name to honor the Agaidika Shoshone Bannock, and it is what they use and what they prefer. And Sakajuwea was from the Agaidika band. Agaidika means salmon eaters. Agai, salmon. Dika eaters. Um, you may have heard of the sheep eaters, um, who are another band of Shoshone. Um, their name was uh, in their language is the Tuka Dika, sheep eaters. Tuka sheep Dika eaters. Um, so it's often said that Sacagawea, the Shoshone version, has um, de was derived from the Shoshone word for boat puller or boat launcher. Another theory that came about was that. Well, no, it was never Shoshone. Sacagawea was created or used by Nicholas Biddle, one of the early editors of the journals, and that he was the first person to use this spelling. Um, but this is not what Shoshone people believe. Um, 
So some Agadica descendants of Sacagawea believe that her name means it is her burden bag. So Sacaja, um, it is her wea burden bag. So a wea or burden bag is a wood bark bag that um, Agadica women would carry with them. It's usually about this big made out of wood bark. Uh, bark bags were also used among the Salish and other indigenous nations. So how did a name possibly, how could it go, how could she go from Sacagawea to Sakakawea to Sakagawea, um, you know, so Sacagawea, uh, maybe boat launcher, or it is her burden bag to Sakakawea, bird woman. So how, how could that be? So one possible explanation, according to Agadika elder and descendant of Sacagawea, Roseanne George Abrahamson, is that when she was kidnapped and arrived among the man in Hadatha, her name was mispronounced as that language should not have a traditional ja sound. So this is a oral tradition according to the um, Agadika people. Um, another is that her name was something completely different um, and that when she was given and that when she was brought among the Mandan Hadatha, she was given Sakago and that it would be translated back to Sacagawea when she arrived among our people. So while there's probably never going to be a cor correct pronunciation that will solve for everyone's liking, um, I think we can all agree that she played an important role in American history. So next to talk about the early days of Sacagawea. So this is another image from our site here. Um, this is a picture of what are known as sometimes wiki ups or brush mat shelters, and it's a type of summer home that um, many nomadic people would use. Um, it's just kind of some sticks put together, a summer home that you could just put up really quickly, would let the breeze in, um, and you'd stay cool. So with that, um, Sacagawea's people, the Agadika, Shoshone, and Bannock, uh, were nomadic people. Um, they moved with the seasons, so they moved around on a seasonal round. And Sacagawea is believed to have been born around 1788 in present-day Limhigh County here in, in Salmon. Uh, her people moved with the seasons, and their homeland contained present-day Salmon, Idaho, and Limhigh County. They knew this area and know this area as Agaiboth, which means Salmon Valley. Sometime around 1800, during an annual buffalo hunt, a Hadatsa war party attacked the Agadika at the Three Forks of the Missouri River in present day Montana. So over a hundred miles from here. Sacagawea was about 12 years old at the time and she was taken hostage along with several other Agadika. Hidatha took the hostages to the Knife River Village complex in located in present day North Dakota. And it was a large Mandan and Hidatsa trading center. Within the next few years, Sacagawea would become the woman of a French Canadian trapper and interpreter Toussaint Charbonneau. Um, the circumstances of their union are debated to this day. Um, we think she was more than likely sold um, to Charbonneau uh, as she, you know, she had been kidnapped. Uh, so she was more than likely sold. Some people think she was won in a por poker game by Charbonneau, but either way, um, this the idea of, of their union is debated. And Charbonneau had at least two Shoshone wives. Um, the second known as Otter Woman coming from another band of Shoshone who li who would have lived south of the Agaidika. So we don't know a lot about Sacagawea's life. We don't know a lot about what she went through at um, the Knife River Villages, but you know we do know that the Lewis and Clark expedition would build Fort Mandan near the Knife River Village complex in preparation for the winter of 1804 to 1805. And they would hire Toussaint Charbonneau as an interpreter to go along with him in November 1804. When Lewis and Clark learned Sacagawea's people were the Shoshone living near the divide between the Missouri and Columbia rivers, her interpretive skills became an unexpected benefit to hiring Charbonneau. On November 4th, 1804, the captains met Charbonneau and Clark wrote, we engaged him to go with us and take one of his lives to interpret the snake Shoshone language. Um, Charbonneau wasn't uh, the most helpful or probably the best person along the um, expedition, but Sacagawea having her along was a huge benefit to the captains. Sacagawea would give birth to her first child, a son named Jean-Baptiste, on February 11th, 1805. Um, he was given the nickname of Bump, which means firstborn in the Agadica Shoshone dialect. 
He would be the youngest member of the expedition, leaving in a cradle board on his mother's back at almost three months old. In March 1805, Charbonneau suddenly canceled the arrangement, having been corrupted, as the captain said, by representatives of British trade companies. After six days, he relented and returned to his job, much to the relief of the captains, as one can imagine, um, as they had been told they need they were going to have to find the Shoshone and trade for horses in order to cross the mountains that lay ahead. So relief that Charbonneau was coming back, maybe not so much for Charbonneau, but because of who would be coming with him, and that would be Sacagawea. Charbonneau, Sacagawea, and John Baptiste departed Fort Mandan for points west with the expedition on April 7, 1805. And Sacagawea was believed to have been around 16 or 17 years old at the time. Um, so here again, here's another picture oops, from our site of uh, just a traditional um, teepee uh, with a canvas covering. And, you know, Sacagawea being from the nomadic people, they had homes that, you know, could be transported or put up quickly and moved um, easily. So when she would go um, be brought among the Mandan Hidatsa, they were more sedentary, a little more like agricultural style. Um, they did, you know, go hunt for buffalo and go move some, but not as much as some of the different indigenous nations that would follow um, that we call the seasonal rounds, um, like Sacagawea's people, the Agadica. So... I could hopefully keep you guys here for a couple hours talking about Sacagawea and things that she brought to the expedition and how she helped um, the expedition. You know, she had a knowledge of native plants of the area, of what ones to eat, um, what ones not to eat. You know, one of the, the plants out here, a traditional plant that was important to the Shoshone Bannock, as well as the Nez Perce, is um, camas. And the thing with camas is having to be known, having to know what camas is um, okay to eat and what is known as death camas. Named so because, well, it kill you. Um, so, you know, her knowledge of native plants was important. Um, she's also one of the instances that the captains record of her in the journals of her, her kind of her bravery is when one of the boats capsized on the Missouri River and she um, is gathering some of these items that are floating out into the Missouri River, um, different specimens they've collected, probably medicine, um, you know, as the captain's watching horror as things are floating out of this boat and Charbonneau is just kind of sitting there with his hands over his head, not sure what to do. Um, and she's just calmly collecting things. Um, the captains would write about that experience. Um, she also, you know, when the things we talk about, when we talk about her and her, her kind of, the importance she had to the expedition was, she also served as a symbol of peace among different indigenous nations because um, many war parties would not be uh, going anywhere with a woman and a, a child with them. So she served as a symbol of peace. Um, you know, a lot of people talk about Sacagawea, um, that she was a guide, that, you know, she guided the expedition all the way to the Pacific Ocean and back. And when we talk about her as a guide, we are we are very specific. Um, we talk about her that, yes, she probably did serve as a guide in these, this the region she was from in her homelands. Um, but, you know, how could she serve as a guide to the Pacific Ocean and all the way back to North Dakota when she'd never been? As far as we know, she'd never been to the Pacific Ocean. Um, how can anyone serve as a guide if they've never been there? But, uh, you know, from instances in the journal, um, we are more than certain that, you know, she did, in fact, act as a guide um, when they were in her homelands. Uh, she got near the Three Forks of the Missouri River, she would kind of inform the captains that, you know, this is where, this is the homelands, where, uh, this is where I was captured and we're getting close to the homelands of my people. Um, she would recognize Beaverhead Rock as a landmark um, outside of Dillon, Montana, about an hour by car from here, and be able to say, you know, we're getting close to where my people should be. So she did recognize different things. She also would help guide Clark on the way back after the captains have split up. She would guard the, the party with Clark um, through what is now known as Bozeman Pass. Um, so this image right here is a fairly famous painting um, depicting Lewis and Clark, the expedition at the Three Forks of the Missouri River. And again, kind of showing Sacagawea pointing the way, which way to go. Um, this was done by Edgar S. Lewis, um, and it was he was commissioned to do this for the Montana State Capitol in Helena, Montana, uh, where this is still at today. 
today. Well, it might be over in the Historical Society, but there is a copy of it over in the um, House of Representatives. Um, and we talked about she served as a symbol of peace among different nations. Um, this is uh, from, also from the state capital in Montana, and this is depicting Lewis and Clark meeting the Salish at Ross Hole, um, about three, I guess, three hours by car from here after they've crossed the Bitterroot Mountains. Um, Sacagawea is over here in the corner with a kneeling with a Jean Baptiste and a cradle board on her back. Um, the interesting thing about this one is um, it was done by Charlie Russell, the famous Western painter. Uh, he was commissioned to do this for the Montana Capitol and uh, is a floor to ceiling painting. Um, they had to take off the roof of the Capitol building in Helena to get it in. And it is takes up the whole wall behind um, where the speaker, the house of the speaker's podium is in the um, House of Representatives. And um, I grew up in Montana and the folklore that we were, we were always told is that this wolf down here, um, who's kind of glaring back over his shoulder, that at the time Charlie Russell was commissioned to do this back in the late 1800s, um, he was sworn enemies with the Speaker of the House. So he put this wolf in here to always glare down and sneer at where the Speaker stands. So today, if you watch at Montana State Legislature um, meeting and anybody who's stand, standing at the Speaker podium, that wolf is right above them, glaring down at them. So uh, kind of, I guess, the folklore is it was Charlie, Charlie Russell's way of getting back at his sworn enemy. Um, so with that... The one thing we, when we do, if we're going to talk about anything that's Sacagawea, the, the part that we find here at the center, the most, most critical that, you know, we, we say Lewis and Clark would have been done at this point if it had not been for Sacagawea. And that was um, trading for horses among the people. So after arriving at Camp Fortunate, uh, which is about an hour two hours from here, near between here and um, Dillon, Montana. Um, and this is where they would camp as they're getting closer to the Radica. Um, it's now under the waters of Clark Canyon Reservoir, but Lewis and a small party would head out to find the people of Sacagawea. We don't know why they didn't take Sacagawea with them, this small party, but either way, um, Lewis had found that he was going to you know, he, he was going to go find and he was going to make the signal of friendship known to the Indians of the Rocky Mountain and those of the Missouri, which is by holding the mantle or robe in your hands at two corners and throwing it up in the air higher than the head, bring it to the earth as if in the act of spreading it, thus repeating three times. This signal of the robe has arisen as a custom among all the nations of spreading a robe or skin for the guests to sit on when they are visited. And Lewis, right, he wrote that in his journal, that this was what he was going to do and how he was going to greet the Agaidika when he saw him. He would also say that this signal did not have the desired effect. So Lewis and this small party, after setting up, they would come up into those mountains I showed you earlier, um, the Beaverhead Mountains, up around what we now call Limhigh Pass. Um, it's also where one of the headwaters of the Missouri Rivers is, um, which he, Captain Private Hugh McNeil would straddle upon seeing it and thank his God that he had been, he lived to bestride the mighty Missouri. Um, but this small party would see three mounted um, Agadika Shoshone warriors. And Lewis would do this uh, spreading, you know, throwing the blanket in the air and then spreading it up. And he says he did not have the desired effect. So he, they approached the party at a closer distance and Lewis would roll down his sleeve to show his arm and pointing at it saying, Taba bone, Taba bone. So through translation, through Charbonneau, he, they had asked Sacagawea, what is the word for white man? And there was no such word for a white man in the Shoshone language at that time. So she would have given him, Sacagawea would have given him something more along the lines of stranger. And according to Roseanne George Abrahamson, um, descendant of Sacagawea, and Agadika Elder, instead of saying something like stranger, Lewis was instead pronouncing it wrong, saying, saying something like Tabi Bone, Tabi Bone. He was saying Tabi Bone, Tabi Bone, and that means look at the sun. So he was pointing at his arm, saying, Look at the sun, look at the sun. And um, as you can imagine, the Agadika men would turn and ride away. Um, 
And still, even I think even if Lewis was pointing at his arm and saying stranger, I, I think that would be quite the strange sight. <laughs> so later, um, a couple days later, Lewis and the men would encounter three Agadica women and would be able to approach them. They gave them small trinkets and painted vermilion, which is a type of um, red clay, on their face, which was a sign of peace that they had been told. Lewis would then be taken and meet with the rest of the Agadica band, and upon leading the, meeting the leader, Kamioe would urge the leader to go back with him to meet the rest of the expedition, and he said that included a woman of Kamioe's nation. Um, we don't know what Kamioe means, but um, some Agadica oral history says that Kamioe uh, means something along the lines of, I'm not going with you. Um, that, that maybe wasn't his name, but what he was trying to tell Lewis was, Kamioe, Kamioe, I'm not going with you. So on the morning of August 27th, 1805, a joyful and emotional reunion between Sacagawea and her people took place. Clark wrote that she danced for the joyful sight and she made signs to me that they were her nation. Um, and more than in the, um, it just as a side, uh, many of these uh, indigenous nations out here, uh, you, you, they used a kind of a common, what we call the um, Indian plain sign language. Um, sometimes also the Chinook jargon was also one uh, because none of these nations usually spoke the same language. Um, they had different languages. So how do you communicate with people who don't speak the same language as you? So there was some universal signs for the different tribes um, as well as a few other things. So one of those was, um, the sign of a nation, and that was this. Um, so she would make that sign according to Clark, and the great chief of this nation proved to be the brother of the woman with us and is a man of influence. So to the captain's surprise, um, Kamewe proves to be a relative of Sacagawea. Lewis also wrote of the reunion, stating the meeting of those people was really affecting, particularly between Sacagawea and an Indian woman who had been taken prisoner at the same time with her and would afterwards escaped from the Hadatsa and rejoined her nation. Um, that young woman was known as Jumping Fish, um, and this was due to the streams and the rivers that she jumped to get back to her people after she'd been captured with Sacagawea. Um, there is a children's book called Nayanuki um, that's loosely based on, on Jumping Fish's story. So that evening, as discussions began again on acquiring the horses, um, up to this point, Lewis had not had really any luck in um, succeed in getting Kamehameha to agree to, to trade for horses. Um, and Sacagawea would play an inter integral role um, in what we know and what we call the translation chain. So what that means is, um, you know, Kamehameha did not speak English. Lewis did not speak Shoshone. So how do these two men communicate? Um, so the captains would speak in English to Francois Labiche, who would in turn speak in French to Charbonneau, who would then speak in Hadatsa to Sacagawea, who had then translated the message into Shoshone to Kamehameha and back. Her role in this translation chain and just her presence um, helped the expedition secure the horses that they needed in order to continue over um, the Bitterroot Mountains and then up over Los, uh, Lolo Trail. <clears throat> Excuse me, I a little water. So besides securing horses, um, they would also help carry cargo and shared an air and knowledge of the area to come. Um, they also would provide a member of their band, an um, Agadika man named Old Toby, and he would ex ex um, assist the expedition on their way over the Bitterroot Mountains. Um, when it, uh, this is a whole, a uh, whole other story, but, uh, when Lou, uh, Clark, you know, the thing Clark were looking for was waterways. Um, and so for those of you from, maybe familiar with this area, uh, the Salmon River runs right, right through here. Um, and it's known as the river of no return because back in the day, um, when ship, uh, boats would go down the river, they didn't come back. They would actually be dismantled and the wood used um, up in other parts of Idaho uh, where they'd, they'd sailed down the river from. So um, the river of no return and old Toby had told the, um, Clark specifically, you, you're not going down that river. It's not possible. You'll never make it down it. And Clark didn't really believe him and tried and uh, he got 
uh, several miles down the Salmon River um, and found out, yeah, it is impassable. Um, so old Toby was a huge help in, in helping them not only then come back from that river up over the Bitterroots, but guided them through that way. So um, another debate um, and kind of controversy about Sacagawea is what happened to her after the expedition. So after wintering at Fort Clatsop, the expedition started on its return trip to in return trip east in March 1806. Almost a year after being reunited with her people, Sacagawea Bump and Charbonneau would lead the expedition August 17, 1806, upon their return to the Knife River villages in present-day North Dakota. While Charbonneau was compensated for his services, Sacagawea never received any compensation or pay. Her Sacagawea and her family would remain at the villages for three years before moving to St. Louis in 1809. After two years, Charbonneau and Sacagawea would leave Jean-Baptiste with Clark to be educated and return to the upper Missouri River. In 1812, Sacagawea gave birth to a little girl, Lisette, at Fort Manual, where Charbonneau worked as interpreter. After this time in her life, there are still, again, debates on um, when did Sacagawea die. So most historians and some Agadica, including her descendants, believe Sacagawea died at Fort Manuel in present-day South Dakota on December 12, 1812, and more than likely of what they call putrid fever. And the written evidence tends to lean heavily in favor of this date. They cite the journals of John Ludwig, the clerk of the fort who had recorded the death of Charbonneau's wife saying, this evening, the wife of Charbonneau, a snake squaw, died of putrid fever. She was a good and best woman in the fort, aged about 25, she left a fine infant girl. Captain Clark, when recording the fates of different members of the expedition between 1825 and 1828, noted that she was deceased. In 1813, a St. Louis court document showed Ludwig, the court, uh, the clerk at the at the at the fort as the custodial guardian of guardian of the children. Um, he would be replaced by Captain Clark as the guardian, and uh, Clark would pay for the raising and educating of um, Sacagawea's children. However, according to Eastern Shoshone oral tradition, um, the Eastern Shoshone people uh, mainly live um, in Wyoming um, on the Wind River Reservation. Um, the Agadika are not. Uh, band of the Eastern Shoshone. Um, they are banned from the Northern Shoshone, just for, for reference. Um, it was, but according to Eastern Shoshone oral tradition and, and some, I'm sure some Shoshone Bannock oral tradition as well, um, it was Charbonneau's other wife, Otter Woman, who died at Fort Manuel. They believe that Sacagawea left Charbonneau in 1813, went to live with the Eastern Shoshone and died on April 9th, 1884 in Fort Washakie, Wyoming. Um, oral traditions do play, they play a critical role in helping historians tell a whole story in um, all sides of history. So, um, you know, while written evidence points to an earlier death, um, that doesn't mean the case is closed. Um, and as historians, we're trying to continue to remember to acknowledge and include oral history as an accurate and, um, legend and credible source. So... The oral traditions of the Eastern Shoshone would come to light in the early 1900s when Grace Raymond Hebbard, um, this woman pictured here, not the best uh, kind of grainy image of her, but this is Dr. Hebbard, um, a political science professor at the University of Wyoming, printed an article in 1907 stating a member of the Wyoming leg legislature had informed her that he actually knew Sacagawea and her children. This would lead Hebbard to work on interviewing and producing information that suggested Sacagawea did not die in 1812 and died in 1884 and was buried on the Wind River Reservation in present day Wyoming. Uh, she would produce a biography of Sacagawea in 1933 entitled Sacagawea, a guide interpreter of the Lewis and Clark expedition. Because of the back and forth at, in the early 1900s between Wyoming and South Dakota on Sacagawea, where Sacagawea was buried, um, the Bureau of Indian Affairs would hire Dr. Charles Eastman to investigate and find out where she was buried. Dr. Eastman was Santee, Dakota, and a, was a physician who had attended to and assisted the wounded at the massacre um, at Wounded Knee in 1890. Um, he would interview people from the Comanche, the Gravant Hidatsa, and Eastern Shoshone tribes 
um, but not the Agadiga band um, of Sacagawea. He, like Hebbard, believed that Sacagawea lived until 1884 and died on the Wind, Res Wind River Reservation. Um, she does have a marked grave on the Wind River Reservation, and there have been several books written on the topic of the true identity of the woman buried there. Um, Dr. Eastman's kind of reasoning for why she, uh, why he thought she was buried in Wyoming was that, you know, he himself being Dakota um, said, you know, an indigenous mother would never, never leave her children behind um, in another state. So that was kind of one of his reasoning besides all these interviews he did conduct. Um, so while it's not known and it'll probably never be known, um, what date Sacagawea died or who it is buried in the grave marked for her on the Wind River Reservation. Um, you know, the larger than life role that Sacagawea has played in American history really can't be debated. So, you know, people ask us, well, uh, you know, what, what do you mean? She's so famous, but we don't know anything about her. Uh, you know, why? She's this really important part of American history. How can we not know anything about her? Well, it really wasn't until the turn of the 20th century that Sacagawea came into the American consciousness as, as being important. Um, you know, so for almost a hundred years, she wasn't talked about really. That, I mean, the expedition wasn't particularly talked about, but she specifically was not really talked about. But um, at the turn of that, the 20th century, there was an influx of literature and books about the expedition in, in Sacagawea. Um, in 1902, Oregon suffragette Eva Emery died published her book, Conquest, The True Story of Lewis and Clark. The women's suffrage movement had been looking for a heroine to push their cause forward, and they would find one or more accurately create one in Sacagawea. Di would later tell people that she essentially exclaimed upon hearing the story of Sacagawea that she had found her heroine. Sacagawea and York, the African-American man enslaved by Clark, were both given a vote on where to set up camp in December 1805. Though not an entirely democratic process, um, each vote counted and Fort Clatsop was built and the Corps stayed there from December to March 1806. Besides having a vote, the suffragettes argued that Sacagawea was a civilizing agent were all, as were all women and she showed that motherhood and patriotism go hand in hand. She has also been referred to as the ultimate working mother since she completed the arduous journey while caring for an infant the entire way. So in 1905, the National American Women's Suffrage Movement Organization held its 37th annual meeting at the First Congregational Church in Portland, Oregon. The convention met from June 29th through July 5th to discuss ways to advance women's suffrage rights. Notable attendees included Susan B. Anthony, Anna Howard Shaw, Carrie Chapman Catt, and Lucy Stone. This meeting also coincided with the 1905 Lewis and Clark expedition that was also taking place in Portland, Oregon. Eva Emery Dye led the Stat Sacagawea Statue Association, which raised funds selling Sacagawea buttons and spoons. They collected over $7,000 to have sculptor Alice Cooper create a copper statue of Sacagawea. It was unveiled during the expedition in Portland and July 6, 1905 was proclaimed Sacagawea Day, though December 20th um, is now known as Sacagawea Day. The statue was unique in that it was of a woman, funded by women, and created by a woman. So um, this is an image of that statue. Um, it is still exists uh, in Portland, Oregon. So while the suffragettes upheld Sacagawea as a shining example of why Euro-American women should have the right to vote. Um, if Sacagawea herself had been alive, she would not have been allowed to vote. The 19th Amendment was ratified in 1920, but Indigenous people were not granted United States citizenship until 1921 was the Snyder Act and not, grind, and not granted full voting rights in each state until the 1960s with Utah formally recognizing the votes of indigenous people to vote. And, I'm sorry, recognizing the right of indigenous people to vote. So even though they used the image of Sacagawea, um, you know, she'd been there, she wouldn't have been able to vote. So 1905 is a, a long time ago, um, but this was not the first statue, uh, known statue of Sacagawea. In 1904, 
Bruno Louis Zim was commissioned to create a statue of Sacagawea for the Louisiana Purchase Exposition at the St. Louis World's Fair, which marked 100 years since the Louisiana Purchase and the start of the expedition. So nearly 100 years after Sacagawea's remarkable journey, another young woman from the Agadica Shishombanic Nation would have a part in creating history. Um, and again, this is the, uh, the first known statue of Sacagawea um, by Bruno Louis Sim, um, and it, it no longer um, exists. It did um, fall apart. So also taking place at the World Fair in 1904 was the Indian School Exhibit Hall. The girls basketball team from Fort, the Fort Shaw Boarding School near present day Great Falls, Montana, was not only in the Indian School Exhibit Hall, but played exhibition basketball games. Minnie Haha, Minnie Burton, was one of the first Native, Native Americans to make a name for herself as a basketball player back in 1904. Um, at this point, basketball had not been along for very, very, had not been around for very long. So Minnie, um, pictured here, um, was a member of the Agadika Shishon Bannock and was from the Limhi Valley. In 1902, Burton and her family were struggling to make Minzy in the Limhi Min, ugh, make ends meet in the Limhi Valley. And so Minnie's father made the difficult decision to send her to a boarding school um, that was located at Fort Shaw in Montana. I'm um, about five hours by car from here. There she flourished thanks to the game of basketball, which she'd never heard of, but proceeded to excel in. Um, the Fort Shaw girls team became a sensation in Montana, beating the boys teams, college women's teams, and finally performing at the St. Louis World's Fair in 1904 for the crown of national champion. Um, they're playing for the world by Montana PBS chronicles the Fort Shaw team's experience and the book Full Court Quest also deals with the subject. Um, they would win and they would be proclaimed champions of the world. So the first um, ever basketball champions to exist. Um, so one of the, the women from Sacagawea's band uh, would be one of the first basketball player, uh, first basketball players crowned uh, world champion. On May 4th, 1907, um, somewhere along Birch Creek uh, here in Idaho, Minnie would give birth to a daughter while on the forced march of the Agadica people from the Limhi Reservation here in the Salmon Valley to the Fort Hall Indian Reservation, which is about three hours by car here, um, which was the reservation of different bands of Shoshone and Bannock people. Um, for a little background on that, um, the what we call as known as the mixed bands of Chief Tendoy, who was a descendant of Sacagawea um, and kind of the last leader of the Agadica, um, they had been granted an executive order, and I say granted loosely, um, they had agreed to give up land in exchange for a reservation here in the Limhi Valley, Limhi region, the Salmon Valley. Um, they had signed a treaty, uh, it was not ratified by the United States government. So instead they ended up with a executive order reservation. Um, and the problem with executive order reservations is that uh, a president grants it, but at any time a president can take it away. So, and that would be what happened to the Agadika and the other um, Tukadika, other mixed bands um, under Tindoy's leadership is that in um, the early 1900s, 1905, 1907, um, they were the Agadika uh, and others were forcibly removed from their reservation here uh, in the Limhi Valley under order of the president um, and taken to Fort Hall to join other bands of Shoshone and Bannock people. Uh, at Fort Hall, Minnie would marry a man named Stanton Gibson and have two children. After a divorce, she married Robert Tindor and had another daughter. In 1918, shortly after the birth of her fifth child, um, she died at the age of 33. Minnie never shared her story with her children and her family, knew almost nothing of her life at Fort Shaw um, until 2001 when the authors of the book Full Court Quest went to Fort Hall to share documents and speak with them. Minnie's fifth child, Friday, uh, who was then 84 years old, cried at seeing the images of his mother he never got to know and hearing the stories of her athleticism as told to him by Minnie's great-granddaughter, um, Drusilla Gold. 
Um, Drusilla is well known out here. Um, she is a member of the Shishon Vanek Nations and she has worked um, here in Salmon at our local historical society translating different items um, into Shoshone words and helping them kind of create some exhibits on, on the original inhabitants of this valley. Um, Friday, Tindor would die three years later in 2004. Um, kind of, I, I share this story because to me, it's such a neat story. Um, and so just shows the, the, the place, the Agadika Shoshone Bannock have in American history that um, two women, both from the Salmon Valley, um, to Agadika women from the Salmon Valley would make history incredible ways. The first woman to vote and being held, upheld as that, and the first um, world basketball champion ever. So um, in 1910, two statues were also uh, erected of Sacagawea, one of them by Edward Cyrus Dowlin and one by Len Lenard Colonel, um, a French immigrant commissioned by the General Foundation of Women's Clubs in North Dakota um, that was to be placed in front of the North Dakota Capitol building. Um, so here's an image of um, Sakakawea and John Baptiste by Leonard Cornell featuring the um, spelling with the two Ks, the more of the traditional Mandan Hidatsa spelling. A 2003 cast of Cornell's statue, Sakakawea, would be placed as one of North Dakota's two statues for the National Statuary Hall in Washington, D.C. So um, each state in the Union has two statues that depict notable persons in that state's history. Um, and the Sakakawea statue is in the Capitol Visitor Center where um, Idaho's statue of William Bora is also displayed. Um, Idaho, even though, well, you know, this is uh, her homeland, um, our two people in our statue hall are William Bora and um, George, Governor, the one of the first governors, Governor George Shoup. So, um, and here's an image of that um, from the Statuary Hall, or um, excuse me, it is part of the Statuary Hall, but it's in the U.S. Capitol Visitor Center um, for the, the state of North Dakota, Sacagawea statue. Um, besides statues, Sacagawea has been recognized in honor in other ways. Um, in 2000, the U.S. Treasury issued the Sacagawea dollar. The dollar features an image of Sacagawea with her son, Jean-Baptiste, um, on it. Randy L. Teton, a member of the Shoshone Bannock tribes is the model for the coin. And as far as I know, she's the only living model of a US coin today. And uh, just for a little plug for anyone interested, um, uh, this was also, this image was created by Glenna Goodacre, who is an indigenous artist um, and featuring Randy L. Teton, who's an enrolled Shoshone Bannock tribal member. Um, and Randy L. also just published a book about Sacagawea. Um, this is her story, Sacagawea. It's a children's book. Um, and it's the first book that I know of that is from the perspective of, and done by a Shoshone Bannock person about Sacagawea. So the dollar, the Sacagawea dollar replaced the Susan B. Anthony dollar, which had circulated from 1979 to 1981. And again, in 1999, while Sacagawea was neither, was neither an enlisted member nor a hired member of the expedition and never received any compensation of any sort for her guidance and assistance, in 2001, President Bill Clinton awarded Sacagawea an honorary sergeant in the regular army position. She's also been named, uh, had ships named after her. Um, there are two ships named after her, a tugboat tugboat in 1942 and then this one in 2005 it's a lewis and clark class dry um, cargo ship that is still in active duty today um, and this was um blessed when it went in, out in 2005 it was blessed by one of um, her familial descendants through kamehawe um and tendoy uh, a few others uh images so uh, you know, we talk about modern representations of Sacagawea as well. Um, these are two that I uh, kind of shudder when I think of. Um, the Far Horizons was an, a movie from the um, 60s. And uh, as you can see, it features uh, Donna Reed as Sacagawea. Um, and then this is a book from the 1970s by um, Anna Waldo. A lot of people come to us and say, oh, I read her biography by Anna Waldo. Um, and we have to say, well, <laughs> it's um, a historical fiction. Uh, there's a few things in there that are true, but it is not her um, biography. 
So again, these are just some images of kind of other representations of Sacagawea. Um, you know, the thing it's been good to see is um, people acknowledging and coming and bringing forth her people's story and, and kind of, I hope we are moving in a direction of, um, you know, showing her and telling her people's story um, and not having um, Donna Reed play her in a movie. So while Sacagawea was overlooked during her life, um, the many tributes to her, both through monuments and works of literature, just show how much of an impact she's made in American history. And um, the Sacagawea Center hopes, we hope to work to continue to remind folks of her legacy, as well as the history and many contributions um, of her people, uh, the Agadika Shishon Bannock, um, both past and present. Um, and here's just another image from our site. Um, again, there's the, the Beaverhead Mountains where, uh, where um, the expedition uh, would meet Sacagawea's people and Sacagawea would be reunited with her people. 